that we formed hydrogen gas and we ended up calling that H2, not just H, which is a tricky aspect. This comes back to the chemistry of some of our elements. Some of our elements are so unstable that they must be near a like element if they're by themselves. Right, so if I see hydrogen written all by itself, Okay, with no charge, it must be H2. There has to be two hydrogens. And because there's two, it's referred to as diatomic, for two atoms. There are seven you have to have memorized. There's the mnemonic device we mentioned, have no fear of ice cold beer. That matches up with each of those elements. Works out pretty well. I would highly encourage you to memorize that. The other one we talked about at the last kind of second was what uh, a tutor liked to remember. I think because he played hockey. We have kind of the hockey stick over here. And we have the puck, right? So that was one analogy. The other option that I've heard, what does that look like? Don't tell me a hockey stick. OK. Seven. I like seven. I know there's tons of things it could look like. Let's not stress on that. But it looks like a seven. How many elements are in that seven? Six. So that can't possibly be right. There must be an extra one. Oh, there it is, hydrogen. Okay. So the shape of it could help you memorize that, if you will, as well. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Is that chemical reaction decomposition? Uh, we will talk about, uh, actually, it's not in the slides to talk about what that chemical reaction is. It is not a decomposition, it is a double replacement or a neutralization reaction. We'll talk about that as well. Okay. But before we get into that, we'll do another nomenclature practice. Uh, what do we got? Uh, 110 is how long you've got to get these finished. Eleven. Oh, I'm not only have a pen ready. That doesn't count. What are you talking about three ice cubes? Are you just trying to distract me? Shoot, only 10 seconds left. Oh, actually. No, wait, that doesn't make sense. Done. I got five seconds to spare. Okay. So, again, process. How did we start? What we know. Get the information down as quickly as you can that you know is true. Okay. After that, you can start to fill back in with the harder stuff. Okay, and if someone was listening to the recording, I apologize for throwing the iPad on the table. That probably sucked. Yes? Um, did you remember, uh, how did you know the charge on chromium? How did I know the charge on chromium? It's just three right there. The Roman numeral is required to specify charge on elements you aren't required to have memorized. So by writing the Roman numeral chromium 3, I know the charge on chromium is a plus 3. Okay. When do we write Roman numerals? metal and you aren't required to have it memorized. Okay. So they need to be your ionic compounds. So interesting, we go up to cadmium. What is cadmium? Cadmium is a metal. Why did I not specify cadmium Roman numeral 2? Cadmium is one of the ones you're required to have memorized as a plus 2. If I write the two there, that is technically correct information, but that is unnecessary information to include, and I am now wrong. Okay? Questions on that? Those of you in the Thursday lab, this might be relevant. Yes? So if we actually count out each every single metal... That might be a little bit more than four, but I would argue the first two sets are easy. Column one, everything in column one is plus one. Column two, 
plus two. So that gets us, what, 12 yeah. elements right off the bat. Then you have silver, cadmium, zinc, and aluminum. That might be the four you're referring to when you say four need to be memorized. Silver is a plus one. Cadmium and zinc are plus two. And then aluminum is plus three. Officially, everything under aluminum has the highest priority charge will be plus three. Aluminum is the only one you're required to memorize because gallium, indium, and tantalum? Mm, I don't think that's tantalum. Thallium? Thallium? Uh, have p the potential for other charges. Okay. Other questions on that? So, uh, will you ever have to specify a negative charge? Like when do we specify a charge? For metals, what charges do metals hold? Positive. positive. They'll always be positive. Okay. So the only time you're using Roman numerals is to specify positive charges and positive charges only. Okay. Nomenclature, for those that haven't gone through and done the whole packet honestly, because you cheated and looked stuff up, which I can't check that, so that's your choice. Okay. But if you've gone through and done the whole packet honestly, you probably are competent enough with nomenclature that you're getting a B to an A when it comes to nomenclature naming parts. Okay? And it should be that kind of second nature and easy for you. If you haven't done that much practice, you're probably below failing, unfortunately. There's a very steep learning curve on nomenclature. You have to do a lot, but once you've done that a lot, it's easy. Okay. Make sense? Ish. Good enough. So, balancing chemical equations. So here's our equation, because a question was brought up about attempting to go through and balance this. What do we need to do? What has to be true for this equation, according to Proust? Proust, how do you say his name? Conservation of mass. Do atoms hold mass? Yes. So that means if I have sodium on the left-hand side, what must I have on the right-hand side? Sodium. sodium. If I have two sodiums on the left-hand side, I need two sodiums on the right-hand side. I can change where they are located. I can change the location of the atoms, but I cannot get rid of the atom for this class. Okay? So let's go through an attempt to balance this. The general form for balancing can vary. Different instructors use different tools. I used to just kind of do it by inspection, looking at it and saying, oh, well, that's balanced. That's a really horrible thing for you to watch. Because if I just look at it and say, well, it's good, does that help you? No. no. So we need something. So let's work with a method that seems to work out well. Right underneath the reaction arrow, because that is effectively our equals, I'll put the name of the element, or the symbol for the element. In this case, Na. I'll look to the left. On the left-hand side, how many sodiums show up? One. And I will put a 1 to the left of the sodium. Okay? Because the 1 kind of left-hand side, right? Right-hand side, how many sodiums show up? 1. So I will put a 1 to the right-hand side of the sodium. Okay? And that may seem like a silly thing to go through and do because you're writing a whole bunch of stuff. It helps. Okay? It's a way of just keeping track of your work to go through and balance. If you can internalize it, by all means, go ahead and do it. Okay? So now we can move to the next thing we'd want to balance. Okay? What would you potentially attempt to balance first or next? Why would you balance hydrogen next? It's the next one after sodium. Is usually why people do it. Okay? I did hear an argument of, well, it shows up in a lot of places. That is actually the exact reason we should not balance hydrogen first. Because it shows up in so many different places, it will be confusing to attempt to balance it. So what I'm going to hope is that by balancing every other atom, when I get back to hydrogen, the equation will have already self-balanced, and I don't have to worry about it. Okay. So next element after hydrogen would then be carbon. carbon. How many carbons on the left? Two. Carbons on the right? Two. Okay. Oxygen's on the left? Two. Two. I heard a one for that one. No. Do you see the mistake? 
Okay, I was hearing things. That's fine. Oxygen's on the right. Two. Hydrogens on the left. Oh, yeah, sorry. We have one, two, and three. So it's showing up in multiple cases, which means we have a total of five. One plus one is two plus three, five. On the right-hand side, what do we have? Three and two gets us five. What does that mean? Balanced. It's balanced. Okay, all the elements matched on both sides of the equation, which now brings up the next fun quick question that students seem to trouble, have trouble with. Okay, what would I ask on a test? Okay, I could ask you to show that. Okay, I could say balance this equation and show the work for it. But what if you're that good at it that you've done it in your head? I can't see your work. You could have just as easily looked at somebody else's test. Okay. So I, I can't really ask this as a show your work question because I'm not going to make people that can do those calculations in their head write it out. Okay. So what can I do? Well, multiple choice. What are the multiple choice questions I could ask? So there's a couple big questions on, and remember we want to focus on balancing, sorry. I could give you a list of five possible reactions and say which of these reactions is balanced. Okay? That's kind of a mean question because what do you have to do? You have to check each of those five. That is possible, and I will admit that has never crossed my mind before, which is really weird. Okay? You would have thought I would have done that. Why did you say that? So we could do balance the equation given, match it up to one of the answers. That could work. Okay. What else could we do? Okay, we could mention the coefficients. How many people know what a coefficient is? <coughs> yeah, there we go. There's a problem with asking this question. As I have found, most people don't know what a coefficient is. That's okay, but we need to define it. What is our coefficient? The coefficient is the number in front of every single one of those compounds. Okay. So, what is the coefficient in front of sodium hydride? Well, I don't see a 1. Why is it not 0? If it was 0, there wouldn't be anything there. There'd be no reason to write sodium hydride. So there is an implied 1. Okay. Why do I mention this? We have lots of cases where we're looking at a blank space and saying there's nothing there, and we define that as zero or one, depending on our context. This is a case where it's coming in as a one. Okay. The more standard way to ask this question is what is the sum of the coefficients in the balanced equation? So sum meaning add them all up. What is the coefficient in front of sodium hydride? In front of the acetic acid, I would make you say that. That's already there. One in front of the sodium acetate. In front of the hydrogen gas. And we have an answer of four. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Okay. So we will balance by changing the coefficient in front. That's going to be our big part of this. We've got guidelines for balancing reactions, which I'm not going to go through today because it's in the video that's online. And as of, I think it was 9.30 this morning, it looked like two people had watched it. Fair enough. That's understandable. Okay, because the due date for it isn't today. The due date for it was or is next Tuesday or Thursday. Why did I put the due date so far out? Because I didn't expect you to turn around that fast on it. But the video is there. We just won't be explicitly working through that practice in class today. We will be doing some balancing. So do you think you have these rules already internalized? No? Then write them down now. This. Okay. In the video, two of these equations... That's kind of a lie. Two of these equations are part of the video. The very first equation is part of the video I go through and actually solve that one beginning the end. Okay? 
The next three I don't actually solve in the video, okay? But I think the second one and the third one are too easy. So in the video I make you solve the, or the second one and the fourth one are too easy. So in the video I posted online, I make you solve the third one. Lucky you. So guess what you're going to solve this time? Second one. Okay. So get that one written out. Okay. If you don't have the rules down yet, once you've got this written down, that second equation to start your balancing, I'll flip back to the rules so you can reference them. Once I'm convinced everybody's watched the video, I will go through and do the third one, but I'm not convinced you've all watched it and attempted it first, so I'm not going to do that yet. <clears throat> I know. That's why I'm not going to do it. So, if we start with the third one, where do we start balancing? Second one. Second one. Second. 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 Bromine. Okay. We could do hydrogen or bromine. It doesn't really matter. Typically, hydrogen and oxygen we should save for the end. Because hydrogen and oxygen are very common elements and they tend to show up multiple places. So in the grand scheme of things, most reactions, hydrogen and oxygen, we want to save for the end because they will show up in multiple places. Bromine, being less common, tends to show up in only one place. On the left, how many bromines do we have? Two. The, co the subscript applies forward to what's directly in front of it and we have two bromines. Make sense? On the right, how much do we have? One. Does 2 equal 1? No. So what do we need to do? I need a second HBr. I can do that by putting the 2 in front. Of HBr. I will not, under any circumstances, make this H2Br2. Why not? What is the subscript? The subscript is the compound. Once you have your product identified, you cannot change the product. You can change the amount of the product, but you can't change the product. Subscripts define the product. They also define the reactant for that matter. So I cannot put a subscript to, I have to put a coefficient out front. I can have multiple HBRs produced, but I can't have one HBR2. Does that make sense? Okay. How many hydrogens do I have on the left? How many hydrogens on the right? Two. two. Why is on the right two and not one? What? Oh, because you already put the coefficient. The two applies through to both things, whatever's immediately after. Okay. So we have two and two. What does that mean? It's balanced. Okay. If we go back to rule, the rules that I listed here, you see rule six? says check your work by repeating steps three through five. So we would go back to our solve here, where we had our bromine, we had the two, we had the H, two, 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 and we'd go back and check our bromine. How many bromines on the left? Two. Bromines on the right? Two. Hydrogens on the left? Two. Hydrogens on the right? Two. two. Cool, so that balanced. Now what should we do? Check your work again. This is something that I like to put out when it's coming to balancing reactions because you will know your answer is correct when you balance reactions. Okay. But you will only know if you check your work. So I want you to check your work okay, again and again and again. When should you stop checking your work? When you are pissed that I told you to check your work that many times. The instant you become angry at me, we're bringing in an emotion. What does that emotion help do? Rip the paper. <coughs> Remember. Remember. Okay. That heightened emotion will hopefully get that to stick in your brain, and you will not forget how to balance an equation. So that when it shows up on a test, you can think back to that anger and be like, I got this, a stupid jerk, and balance it out. Just don't physically act out that anger. Yes. So the question on the test would be sum of the coefficients. What's the sum of the coefficients for that third, second equation? Four. Four. What are other answer choices that you might see? Two. Two. What other answer choices? Three and one. And I'm really out of creativity, so I usually throw in something just random.
<laughs> so most multiple choice tests, one of the answers is completely out of the blue nonsensical. Okay? Sometimes it's made obvious because you get somebody that's lazy and can't come up with a more creative answer. Okay? What can we do? Eliminate that answer. Don't guess that answer. Okay. Why is four there as an answer? Four is the actual answer. Why is three there as an answer? There were three pieces. So if you didn't change anything, you end up with three as an answer. Why is two there as an answer? Because we had two HBR. Why is one there as an answer? We have one H2. Okay. Let's, let's run through this again. One had a valid location in our correct answer. Two had a valid location in our correct answer. Three had a valid location-ish. Four had a valid location in our correct answer. Every single answer shows up in solving the question. What does that mean? You need to know what you're doing, not just randomly mashing numbers together until it adds up to something that's on the total. Okay? Mashing numbers will not work well because I write my tests very carefully. Okay? And as we continue through more examples, you'll find that I get even more obnoxious with the mashing of numbers. I'm very good about recognizing how people will make mistakes, and I include that mistake as an answer choice. Just because you have an answer choice does not mean you're right. Okay? So, next part, classifying chemical reactions. Okay. There are five major classifications that you are responsible for knowing. There is officially a sixth. Okay. What we've got listed here are the basic elements, that, or the basic pieces, I shouldn't say elements, the basic pieces that make up each of these. So when I look at a combination reaction, what is that expression trying to tell me? They just two simple substances. I take two different substances to make complex one thing. A decomposition. One thing, and I make two things. Okay. Notice when we move to the single replacement, double replacement, and neutralizations, that I'm still using our letters A, B, and all that fun stuff, but I've added an extra layer of information. Okay. The blue letter is our cation, the red atom, the red letter, thank you, <laughs> is our anion. Okay. So we have an added layer of information going in on our single replacement, double replacement, and neutralization reactions. Okay. Notice that when we run those reactions, what ends up happening? What happens in the single replacement? Nothing gets changed. We exchange. What did we exchange? The blue letters exchanged locations with each other. Okay. What happened when we moved to the double replacement? The <coughs> we did the red letters switching with each other. Neutralization. What happened to the neutralization? I exchanged H for B to make HOH, and B becomes BA. Notice that when I swap and make my product, what ends up always pairing? What is always with a cation? An anion. Okay. I will never have a cation next to a cation. Why not? Cations are both, you're getting the right idea, cations are both, uh, it's not written there. Uh, positive. positive, because cats have paws. Paws. Cats are positive, or cations are positive. Right. What happens if I bring two positive charges near each other? They repel. How can I keep those two positive charges near each other? I would need neutrons. I'd need glue to keep them there. Okay? So we can't do that within our reaction. Okay? Kind of make sense? Yes. 
Ooh, okay, so I'm getting, getting a little feedback here that maybe this is too easy. So then we'll just make you guys do this. Uh, let's see, which one? Let's do this one. Mm, yeah. Go through and work through that. Sulfur solid reacts with got. Oh, man. Mm, yeah, we're going to have to do that one. Dang it. Sulfur solid reacts with oxygen gas to produce sulfur dioxide. I want you to take that sentence and turn it into a balanced equation. Yes, balanced equation. So we're doing two things this time. We've got or three or four. Nomenclature, converting it into an equation, and then balancing said equation. Sulfur, symbol. Solid, symbol. We need to use our parentheses. Sometimes you'll see it as a subscript. I tend to write it as a subscript just to pull it away from it, but it does not have to be written as a subscript. Reacts with plus oxygen. I would actually just say O. As soon as we see the gas, that should be our tip-off that we're doing O2. And our phase, G for our gas, to produce our arrow, sulfur, dioxide, O2 as a compound. And we've now done a combination reaction. We took two pieces, we mashed them together to make one product. Okay. Why is there not a phase written on that sulfur dioxide? You don't know what it is. Why do you not know what it is? It wasn't written in the statement. That's why you don't know what it is. Okay. You're not expected to be able to predict that phase. Okay. Probably a gas, actually. Questions on that? Okay, right, let's see if we can make it more difficult. Our decomposition reactions. Okay, and our decompositions, we're breaking something apart, okay, to make the simpler substances. I did not just break that. I'm pretty sure I fixed it. Uh, so we could go through and look at heating solid mercury oxide to produce mercury metal and oxygen gas, except I think I... Solve that one in the video, and I don't think I have another example. Yes, I do. Cool, we'll do this one. Metal hydrogen carbonates decompose to give a metal carbonate, water, and carbon dioxide. So we're given the context of what they do, but what's interesting about that statement? Metal. It's metal, generic, any metal. Okay. So what does sodium hydrogen carbonate decompose into? So again, balanced equation. Predict the products, <coughs> all that fun stuff. Predict your products, balance the equation. The only reason you can predict the products here is because I'm telling you what they can make, just not explicitly. That's fantastic. But again, what does the question ask for? Sodium. What does sodium hydrogen carbonate <coughs> decompose into? Is that two separate compounds? No. For it to be two separate compounds, what would we be looking for? Sodium reacts with hydrogen carbonate. Does it say reacts with? No. What is sodium hydrogen carbonate? It is one unit that we are starting with. So this needs to be Na for sodium, H for hydrogen, carbonate is CO3. Is that formula correct? What is the charge on carbonate? Minus 2. Charge on hydrogen? Plus 1. Charge on sodium? Plus 1. Look at that. It's balanced. Decomposes into. There's our reaction arrow. Yeah. Decomposes into. So let's work with that. Metal hydrogen carbonates. What is sodium? A metal. So it fits the pattern of a metal hydrogen carbonate. What does metal hydrogen carbonates decompose into? They give a metal carbonate. Is there a comma after the metal? No. So is this metal and carbonate? No. It's metal combined with the carbonate. What is the symbol for our metal? 
Na. What is our symbol for carbonate? What else does it give as a product? Water, which is the symbol H2O. What else does it give as a product? Carbon dioxide. So take a hot second to deal with There's no evidence. What's that? The sodium is throwing you off. Okay, so what Simon had suggested earlier is he noticed that there's six oxygens and only three oxygens here. I know we should start with oxygen, but it's the easiest way to reference this. So to make this six oxygens, what do I need to do? Put a two in front. Now how many sodiums do I have? Two. And only one here. So what do I need to do? Two in front. But what does that do to the oxygens? That increases my oxygen. So now I have to go back and change that number. But that increases the sodiums. Can't you put a parenthesis around it? Nope. We can't put a parenthesis in here. What's the problem? Okay. In our balancing rules. So let's go back to our balancing rules. Let's point this out. This is a fun little thing. <clears throat> predict the products. Did we predict the products? Yeah. Rule two. Balance formulas to ensure all species are neutral. Then what do you do? Then you can balance the equation. Did we do step two? No. What were you suggesting, Tanner? Sodium hydrogen carbonate, we actually did go through and balance. We started that up. I set you up with a start on that. But then you're right. I just wrote out sodium with our carbonate. What is the charge on carbonate? Negative two. Negative two. What is the so charge on sodium? Plus one. Plus one. Is our formula correct? No. no. How do we fix it? I need the two there. Why can I put that two in to changing the compound? Because I have to to make sure the product is correct. I'm not balancing the equation. Once we start balancing the equation, we can't change the products. But when I'm predicting the product, that's the whole point of predicting a product, is figuring out how many needs to be there. Plus, what do we say? Water and CO2. Is this equation going to balance now? <coughs> yeah, in fact, it balances pretty easily. I think it's ones all the way through. Is that what you got, Justin? First oh, one's first one's two? Oh, yeah, never mind. Okay, we can address that, too. So let's actually stepwise through that balancing process. Where should we start? Sodium. On the left, how many do we have? One. Right. Two. What do we need? Two. I need to put a two where? In front of. Okay, now that I've started balancing the equation, I can only change the coefficients, no subscripts. Next element. I would probably actually balance the hydrogen. Why would I balance the hydrogen instead of the carbon? Hydrogen only shows up in one place on both sides. Carbon shows up twice on the product side. It's that same splitting feature that I said we tried to avoid. Hydrogen and oxygen are the most common uh, bad guys if you will, uh, that most commonly do that, sometimes carbon will do it. What's that? Troublemakers. Troublemakers. I'll accept that. So if we jump to the hydrogen, <laughs> how many hydrogens on the left? Two. On the right? Two. Two. How many, what do we want to do now? Carbon. Now we can switch to carbon. How many carbons on the left? Two. two. So everybody okay with saying two carbons on the left? I heard a couple other answers float out. I need to know if you're okay with this too. Why is it two? This two applies to everything thereafter it. If we look at the carbon, what else applies to it? I said, what else? Nothing else. It's just the two. It has no subscript. Okay? So that subscript is an implied one. We have two times one is two. Carbon's on the right. We have one from our sodium carbonate and one from our carbon dioxide, and we have two. Oxygens? Six, because two and the three come together to get a six on the left. On the right, we have six, and we now have our balanced equation. 
So there was a reference to finding CO2. The CO2 confused you, I'm guessing, because what you were trying to do is balance that as a whole. Okay? There are some species that you can balance as an entire unit through the course of the reaction. This is not one of those kinds of reactions to allow you to do that. We'll see that when we move into one of the later ones. Okay? So again, I want to make sure everybody watches the video first. Okay? You guys got it? Should I be talking more about it? Or we got it? I don't think you just, just, can, just understand the, the oxygen. Yeah. Okay, let's walk through the oxygen again. I have sodium hydrogen carbonate. How many oxygens are in that compound? Three. Three. So you're okay with that? Right. Okay. What does this two mean? I have two of this unit. So I could better or differently write that out. Sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium hydrogen carbonate, right? Mm -hmm. This first one had how many oxygens in it? Three. How many does the second one have? Three. What is the sum of those? Seven. There it is. Okay. Does that make a little more sense? Okay, and, then on that side. and then on the right, Three. our oxygen? Three. Three. One. one. Two. two. Three plus one plus two. Uh, okay. Got it? Yeah. So remember, we can change the location of the atoms. Okay, they can go to entirely different compounds. I just can't destroy an oxygen atom. I can't destroy a hydrogen or create either way. Okay. There is another version of our decompositions, but again, because you aren't required to predict our decompositions, I don't think it's worth spending more time talking about. The single replacements are going to be a big, massive kind of said politer, actually, yeah, a kick in the pants. Okay. Predictions are required for the single replacement reactions. You are required to be able to tell me what the products are. Okay? So, if we take a look at an example, the iron mixed with the copper 2 sulfate is a horrible example, and I have yet to get that edited out of the slides. I do apologize for that. But what I did do was fix it and move to a different example, zinc with the lead sulfate, because that is an example you can work with. So we want to go through and do the single replacement on this. What should we be identifying? The cations. Where are our cations? Or what kind of species would be our cations? Metals. So really what we're looking at is not so much the cation, but the metal. I want to take zinc, because zinc is a metal. And I'm going to take lead, because lead is a metal. a metal, and I want to exchange their locations. So I'm going to end up with Pb plus zinc with the sulfate. Okay. And guess what we have? Our answer, and we can now go through and balance the equation. Okay. There's other bits and pieces that can come into this. Remember we said cation initially, and I switched that up and said we should actually be saying metal. Why did I say metal and not cation? What is the charge on zinc? It's positive. Anyone want to change that answer? What is the charge on this zinc? What are you suggesting it is? Why are you suggesting it's zero? Where is the charge always specified? In the top right corner. What is in the top right corner of this zinc? Nothing, which means the, ox or the charge on that is zero. What is the charge on zinc in zinc sulfate? Our overall compound has a charge of Zero. What is the charge on the sulfate? Negative two. What does the charge on zinc have to be? Positive two. Okay. So for those who say, well, this is something new. No. Okay. This is why when we talked about charge, I said it was always found in the upper right-hand corner. And it always is. What is the charge on zinc sulfate? Zero. The charge on lead? Zero. Charge on lead sulfate? Zero. Charge on zinc? 
Zero. What you are trying to do is now take what you memorize, the common charge for an element in a compound, and saying that applies to everything. That doesn't. Okay. It applies to it when it's in a compound. Zinc will always have a plus two charge in a compound. Is zinc in our reactant here in a compound? No. Okay. Yes. So that's a good question. What is this active metal displaces the other metal in a compound? Okay. Well, that's going to come back to a new definition. We have to know what our activity is in reference to. So before we touch on activity, are we okay with at least following the format of the single replacement reaction? Okay. I want you to prove that. Okay. Give me the products of these single replacement reactions. The first one, what do we want to identify? Find our metals. What happens in a single replacement? Exchange them. <coughs> and what is the charge on magnesium? What is the charge on nitrate? Minus one, because you're required to memorize that. Is that formula balanced? No, so I need to put in two. What have we done? That's it. That's all I was asking you to do. Predict the product. That's it. How about the next one? What are your metals? What is the charge on... S yeah, I did that. What is the charge on silver? How do you know that? You know it. I'll accept that. Silver is one you're required to know. It's a plus one. What is the charge on chloride? Chloride? Negative one. Is that formula balanced? Yes. Why is this three not over there? What is the meaning of that three when we see it in aluminum chloride? There are three chlorides to do what? To balance aluminum. If we look at the product, is that chloride next to aluminum? No. So don't bring the three over to the coefficient or the subscript because it's not with aluminum. Is the equation balanced? No. No, and we know that because on the left hand side, how many chlorines do we have? Three, Three and on the right hand side, Zero. only one. Okay. So to balance it, we would have to go through and adjust. We'd need three silvers and we'd need three silver chlorides. Now our equation would be balanced. Okay. For those of you panicking about all the steps, follow the steps. Okay. Don't start at the beginning and say, well, now I've got to do everything at once. You don't. Each step at a time. Okay. Do not start skipping steps. So the next part of this that Megan brought up, because if you're really saying, oh, my God, this is where it's really going to happen, a more active metal displaces another metal in a compound. Okay. We're saying for the reaction to occur, I have to have a more active metal. So for this reaction, that third reaction to work, what has to be the case? What is happening in that third reaction? What are we saying? Silver replaces aluminum. Why would silver replace aluminum? Because we're saying silver is more active than aluminum. Okay. Is that true? How would I find out? You have to look at a chart. You have to look at some data. So here's some data listing our activity. Lithium is the most active. Gold is our least active. We need to find silver and aluminum on our chart. Where is silver? Third from the bottom. Third from the bottom. Where is aluminum? Way up at the top. Which one is the more active metal? Aluminum. aluminum. Would I expect this reaction to work? No. No. 
Silver is not more active than aluminum. This reaction is actually better specified. Because it doesn't work. It is a non-reaction. Silver is less active than aluminum. Why is silver less active than aluminum is an entirely different question that you probably don't want to ask. Right? What you need to be able to do is to interpret the data given to you. Right? The activity is a way of ranking, when we see these compounds go out into the world, what happens with them. What happens when you drop lithium into water? It explodes. What happens when you drop gold into water? Nothing. <laughs> That's not water. Okay. Let's think about the activity series. Is this something we've actually already done and used? What is the U.S. federal currency based off of? Gold. Sort of. Why is it based off of gold and not lithium? Right. Let's say it was lithium, and we have Fort Knox with thousands and thousands of pounds of lithium stashed inside it. What does a terrorist do? I see your building. That's cool. I'm going to dump water on it. What happened to your currency? It all dissolves because it is exceptionally active. And that currency now dissolves into the ground, and we have no money. Why do we use gold as a currency? Because it's rare. It doesn't dissolve. Rarity is actually irrelevant. If we were really going to go off of rarity, why not use element 113? Because you can't divide For lack of a better word, oot. You can't divide that out amongst three. Oot is massively rare. Why do we not use oot? Okay. The value is something that we've put on it as humans. It also doesn't exist for really long enough to have anything based off of it, but we could pick lead. Yeah, there you go. Why do we not use lead? Where is lead on the activity series? Relative. <laughs> you could kill people with gold, too. That would hurt. Okay. Lead, significantly higher up on the activity series. Higher than even hydrogen. I could take acid and do what to lead? Dissolve it, and it's now no longer present. Why do I keep gold? Gold does not react. It sticks around. Okay. Where else have we seen this? How many of you have potassium jewelry? I would sure hope you didn't, because it's probably melting through you right now. Okay. Potassium, high up on the activity series. Not a good metal for jewelry. What's our classic jewelry metal? Silver. Gold. Platinum. Also happen to be the bottom on our reactivity for our elements. Mercury's got a different issue because it's liquid. So, good question. To answer that question, did that reaction work, we needed to use what? The activity series. So Brandon had a good question. How do I know that if I don't have an activity series? We could go through and memorize it. And we've been memorizing enough stuff so far, right, with nomenclature. So I figure since you're already in the habit of memorizing, you should memorize that too? No. No. I will give you a condensed activity series. In fact, if you take a look at your first exam on the front of it, you will find... A condensed activity series. It was already on your exam. Why was it there? Because you're going to need it for this exam, and I don't want to make multiple cover pages. Okay? You need to be able to use it and manipulate it. The higher on the activity series, the more likely the reaction occurs. The lower on the activity series, the less likely it occurs. Kind of make sense? And if you okay. We're going to ignore the force. We really want to ignore the force thing. Your textbook has a thing on this, so I'll just mention it. Active metals in water, there are some metals that when you drop them into water, what happens? They react very violently. Sodium, okay, potassium, 
So there's several of these things that when they hit water, they are so active that they will react with water. Most metals do not. Okay? So I know we only have a couple minutes, but I need to approach this subject because it is a brain buster, and I need you to spend time thinking about it over the weekend. Okay? Oxidation and reduction. This is a challenging section. The number one part that you need to remember from this, most of what the textbook has for the oxidation and reduction chapter is complete and utter nonsense. It is an important chemical reaction that we need to evaluate. Okay. Oxidation and reduction is a reaction that involves the transfer of electrons from one unit to another. I can talk to myself for five minutes and then make you responsible for that content. Okay, just checking. What happens to calcium in the course of this reaction? What type of reaction occurred here? This is kind of an interesting one. What happened to the calcium? What did it connect with? The HO. With hydroxide. Where is hydroxide in the start? Nowhere. Where is hydroxide? Right there. Right there. What have we done? We've done a single replacement reaction. You exchanged calcium for hydrogen in the course of the reaction. When we put hydrogen by itself, what happens? Why do we specify the two? Because hydrogen, will never be hydrogen is a diatomic element. We need that too. Focus on the calcium. I knew you were going to make fun of me for that. <laughs> what happened to the calcium in the course of the reaction? Said another way, what is the charge on calcium in the reactant? The reactant is over here. Where's the charge written? Nowhere. Upper right hand corner, what is it? Zero. Zero. What is the charge of calcium in the product? Zero. Calcium is not a zero charge, it is, it is a plus two. The compound calcium hydroxide is a zero. Calcium atom in that is a plus two. How do we move from a zero to a plus two? It says right at the top. We transferred electrons. A transfer of electrons is what we're looking at when we're looking at reduction and oxidation. The single replacement reactions are the easiest form of our ox reduction and oxidation reactions. We will be talking about them and what that means to be oxidized, what that means to be reduced, what that means to be an oxidizing agent, a reducing agent. Oxidation state or number and how all of that ties back to what we've been calling charge, but incorrectly. It is actually the oxidation state. I would highly encourage you to read 